Welcome to this third and unfortunately last session of, uh, of uh, this uh, webinar on interventional endoscopy. Last session of the year, but don't worry, next year we'll come back with many more sessions. This session is called uh, the Third Space Endoscopy and it's dedicated to this new technique that has, uh, I would say, really revolutionized the way we uh, look at some diseases, especially achalasia and some mucosal tumors. So we have a beautiful panel of experts coming from all around the world. And um, I remind you to be interactive. Please do not hesitate to ask questions through the Q&A. Juan is sitting here next to me once again. Hello, Juan. And if you want to go live, just raise your hand. Um, Dr. Lise Wanstrom, uh, he's uh, comfortably sitting in this beautiful mansion in the south of France, uh, highly. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we, we <laughs> and we have Dr. Uh, Inoue uh, from uh, Japan uh, and uh, Dr. Philip Chu. Uh, hello, Philip. How are you? Uh, from Hong Kong. So uh, very international uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Donatelli from Paris, much less exotic, is going to join us a little bit later. And uh, I don't know, Lee, you are my co-chair, so I'll let you introduce the first speaker. Okay, uh, Silvana, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be there. I'm sorry I'm not sitting side by side, but the good point is neither of us have to wear a mask. So uh, that's, that's the good news from it. So I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, a, really a leader in surgical endoscopy, a surgeon, uh, Haru Inoue. Uh, I think I imagine every surgeon, every endoscopist in the world knows his name, knows his reputation. Uh, he's really considered the father of poem and the whole, the person that kicked off this whole movement of third space endoscopy, which as Silvana said, has is, is really changed how we think about diseases and certainly how we treat them. So. Uh, Professor Inoue, it's a pleasure to see you, and thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge with us. Thank you very much, Ali, uh, for your kind introduction, and uh, Silvana, uh, thank you very much for your chairman, uh, person, <laughs> sorry. So I'd like to share my slides. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you see my slides? Hello. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, great. Very well. So uh, uh, I would like to talk about the innovation in the surgical endoscopy for esophageal achalasia. So poem and the poef. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the poem procedure. Pro or endoscopic myotomy, uh, we reported it uh, 10 years ago uh, to the Journal of Endoscopy. That is the official journal of uh, ESGE. Uh, European Society of Digestive Endoscopy. Anyway, so create a submucosal tunnel and then uh, perform the uh, circular myotomy. So actual uh, procedure is like this. Now we are, uh, after creating submucosal uh, working space, now we are dissecting the uh, circular muscle. Uh, still we prefer the uh, complete the uh, circular selective myotomy. Uh, we use our splay coagulation, 50 watt. Yes, like this, step by step, uh, carefully watch the fibers. Anyway, so this is a light after completion of the myotomy. You can see uh, some uh, longitudinal muscle uh, remains 
and also Adventitia, you can see it. So uh, this uh, uh, selective myotomy, so we can say that we never touch outside the esophageal, esophageal structure, we never touch it. So uh, now the 10 o'clock direction, you can see a, a mucosal tube of the esophagus from the back side. Okay, so this is a poem procedure. Anyway, most important, it's a dissection, a complete dissection of a lower esophageal sphincter. Anyway, so our so far in our hospital, uh, in our single institute, uh, we performed the last 10 years, uh, 2,200 cases and more. So, um, yes. So um, uh, effective ratio is uh, uh, in, uh, in our hospital is a 95%, but uh, so major institute has the same uh, similar results. So success rate is a 90 to 100%. Uh, but the major concern is a postpone GERD. So potentially 20 to 50% uh, of the patient has the uh, postpone GERD. So how to uh, manage, how to avoid postponed GERD is our major concern. Our double scope method, uh, that is, uh, um, uh, we think it, it, it is must, we have to do it. So double scope method is first reported by Portuguese doctor uh, to the journal of uh, GIE. So uh, like this, so we, we insert the second scope into the stomach. Uh, usually we insert a pediatric scope in the stomach uh, to monitor uh, the uh, uh, intragastric uh, lumen. On the, uh, now the left-hand side, you can see our submucosa uh, mother scope is in a, already reached to the uh, gastric caldera. Um, we can see the right uh, through the uh, cardiac mucosa. Then we can uh, accurately um, evaluate uh, where the mother scope is. Uh, so uh, using this uh, technique, uh, we can evaluate uh, the left side. Uh, our light is on the junction. On the right hand side, you can see um, uh, light is already uh, going far uh, to the uh, gastric, uh, gastric deeper area. So uh, point is uh, we control the gastric myotomy rings one to two uh, centimeter. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kevin Grimes, he conducted the uh, uh, RCT and then his result was um, uh, gastric myotomy more than three centimeter results in uh, increased uh, risk of uh, moderate esophagitis. So um, in order to minimize the uh, reflux disease after POEM, um, we have to control the gastric myotomy rings uh, less than two centimeter. So, Second, second thing uh, I would like to talk about point plus fund application. It's a, uh, it's a uh, yes, additional procedure uh, to the poem. Okay. So one of my colleagues, Dr. Toshimo Risa, she uh, reported our uh, procedure uh, to the journal of endoscopy last year. So actual procedure is like this. Uh, after completion of the POEM procedure, uh, at the distal end of the submucosal tunnel, we get in abdominal cavity. And then um, in this uh, uh, loop and the clip technique, uh, we place, uh, we fix uh, the end loop onto the gastric anterior wall. And normally we place a four clips and the proximal uh, in the um, uh, abdominal esoph esophagus, uh, we place uh, three clips and the, uh, we fix uh, the um, uh, end loop there. And then uh, when we close uh, the end loop, uh, then we can make uh, uh, anterior partial fund application. So first case was done in uh, three years ago in our hospital. 
Uh, so far, we performed this procedure uh, in uh, 45 cases. I would like to uh, uh, talk uh, uh, two techniques. Uh, first one is a uh, loop and creeps. It's a conventional technique. And the, uh, recently, uh, we prefer to uh, do our uh, with a suture. So we demonstrated uh, this uh, technique in a live demonstration uh, at the time of uh, ESGE days uh, last year uh, in a John Martinek Hospital in a Prague. And then uh, another procedure, uh, defined procedure is a POEF, that is the uh, power of endoscope and application using a suture material, what's uh, uh, reported to a journal video GIE. Anyway, so in that procedure, uh, we use uh, uh, VLOC and the uh, our suture uh, needle holder endoscopic. So, Procedure is like this. Um, uh, suture, the anterior wall of the stomach directly. And then uh, we also place a proximal anchor uh, to the level of our esophageal gastric junction. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, light cruise, light cruise uh, in the submucosal tunnel. Anyway. So when we pour the uh, stitch, then we can uh, make an uh, anterior pressure fund application. So I'd like to show you the first case of a suture. So uh, anterior or <coughs> some arterial myotomy was completed. And then now our uh, distal end of the submucosal tunnel, we are approaching the uh, peritoneal cavity. Uh, we are dissecting the peritoneum endoscopically. Behind, you can see a, a back side of the left liver lobe. Now we open up uh, the peritoneum enough to pass through the endoscope. Then we get an abdominal cavity. Of course, uh, we insufflate the uh, uh, abdominal uh, peritoneal cavity uh, using CO2. Now we rotate uh, the suture needle and the, uh, as much as uh, uh, deeper we uh, uh, suture the uh, anterior wall of the stomach. So this is a second scope uh, monitoring. So needle is uh, coming in and then out. As a please also note uh, the, after a poem procedure, hiatus is open like this. So now sutured, then, so this is a proximal placement of the suture. In a submucosal tunnel, almost distal end, and then uh, we found uh, the uh, light cruise, and then now we suture the diaphragm, the part of the diaphragm, like this way. Then uh, we pull the uh, V-lock, then we can uh, make a uh, um, application like this. So a uh, lap, anterior partial lap cover the covering over the open hiatus like that. So this uh, endoscopy image is a very similar to uh, after dove and application. So our uh, technical success rate is 100%. We uh, did it, uh, did this procedure in all cases we applied. Uh, this is the uh, pH study. Um, our top, uh, you can see, um, uh, this is a poem alone. And the bottom, you can see a poem plus found application. Also, uh, the MISTA composite score improved uh, poem plus found application group. So, so because uh, so it's the same uh, mechanism to our uh, Herod Dole fund application. So um, ladies and gentlemen, this is my conclusion. So left to right. So uh, left is uh, our Nissan fund application is a, it's a most uh, uh, 
uh, strong uh, fund application and uh, to pay 270 degree, so Sajan knows well. So Dole is a anterior partial fund application and the POEF is a next to, there's a cross to Dole, not a total equal, but a cross to Dole. And then other things is a uh, arms and armor. So this is our strategy. This is our strategy. So left, left line, left stream is our major uh, strategy to Akaraja patient. So we first, first performed the poem in a posterior war of the esophagus. And then, so just in case the patient becomes the severe guard, good after poem procedure, it's 1% uh, um, of the cases, less than 1% less than of the cases. Um, in such a case, uh, we perform a POEF, uh, or endoscopic fund application in the anterior wall. Uh, that is our major stream. So, um, so postpone so light light and stream is a postpone GERD high risk uh, group. Uh, it's a it's a <laughs> so actually not so many. So uh, we um, mo in most of the Akaraja patient we follow on the uh, left uh, arm uh, strategy. We follow it. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Aro, for this uh, very enlightening uh, presentation. Every time you present, we see something new. Uh, you're always uh, uh, evolving with your with your technique, and um, I uh, I'd like to um, to hear comments from the faculty, but also ask uh, Juan uh, if uh, I know there is a comment from uh, uh, from the audience. And I think one of our fellows, uh, Margarita, would like uh, to ask one question. And the question is uh, whether you think uh, there is a role in preventing GERD uh, of the endoflip device to measure impedance planimetry in order to size the length uh, of the myotomy. Would, that, would endoflip uh, help you tailor the myotomy in order to prevent post-poem uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease? Yes, yes. Uh, so that is a very, very um, uh, good question. And also, uh, uh, we need a comment from uh, uh, Silvana, <laughs> yourself. <laughs> but um, so our strategy is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, we control the myotomy range. So um, honestly talking, uh, we uh, do not use our end of flip at this moment. So uh, regularly in the uh, poem, uh, Akaraja patient, the poem procedure. Uh, we just control the myotomy rings, uh, less than two centimeter gastric side. So, uh, Silvana, so would you comment on the usefulness, usefulness of the uh, uh, end flip? Yes, yes. Margarita worked here, uh, uh, and uh, we, she still collaborates with our center, so she's well aware of what is endoflip, and so uh, is uh, is Lee actually. So the endoflip is a catheter that you can use uh, is an intelligent bougie that you can use to tailor uh, the myotomy, and measure the sensibility at the level of the gastroesophageal junction, and uh, uh, it also um, measure compliance. So you can really tell when your junction is uh, compliant enough uh, to prevent uh, um, dysphagia and, uh, and obstruction, but is still um, tight enough in order to prevent GERD. And it's the only objective tool that we have today intraoperatively in order to understand what we're doing because this is functional surgery and should be based on a full thorough understanding of, uh, of physiology and, and also to correct while we are there uh, our, our actions. So if we've done uh, a too short myotomy or an incomplete myotomy, we can go back and make sure that um, what we can see with our eyes and feel with our scope really matches the physiology. Um, so we use it routinely and we found it extremely useful. We found it also very useful to show that sometimes things look good, but from a functional point of view, they're not. Um, and this is something very important if you want the technique to be standardized. Uh, now, I think that um, 
Professor Inoue has such a big experience uh, that he can just skip the use of endoflip. Uh, but we, uh, if you want to start the technique, it will take you many years to reach his level of proficiency. Uh, he's an endoflip himself. If you don't, uh, if you're not uh, Professor Inoue, I would recommend to use this tool because it's extremely useful in all your functional surgeries or endoscopies, even for an Nissen fundu duplication, you learn a lot. So Sivana, so uh, thank you very much. So may I ask you the technical point of the how to use the end flip? So may I ask you? Um, my question is: uh, During uh, uh, myotomy, you place the end 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 flip in in position in sight, and then so uh, uh, if you are uh, advanced in myotomy or towards the stomach. And the, uh, sometimes you uh, inflate the uh, uh, end flip and then evaluate how uh, well uh, dilate or uh, uh, distension well. So is that the way you, you, you are doing? So what we do, we measure at the beginning of the procedure and we make sure that the, the end of flip, we make sure two things, that the stomach is well deflated. So we'll, we won't have any interference from the, uh, uh, the pneumogastrium on the readings that we have. And that also we're, we, we will have the junction sitting in an anatomical position. Okay, mm -hmm. and then we make sure that the uh, the gastroesophageal junction is really at the uh, midpoint of the endoflip catheter, which is a balloon field of uh, uh, of a solution with electrolyte. So if you don't do that, you will have a reading that doesn't correspond to reality. Then we take it out, we perform our, our tunnel, and we perform our uh, what we think it's a correct uh, myotomy. And uh, um, we, 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 what, we're not too aggressive, actually. As just as what you were mentioning before, we don't go more than two centimeters below uh, the, um, the, uh, the gastroesophageal junction. And we check uh, again with the endoflip, and only then we decide whether we have to go more or not. So really it's a two or three time points. If we feel that we were not aggressive enough, we will keep um, uh, uh, working and then measure it a third time. Lee, we work always together on these cases. Do you want to comment? No, I think you, you present it well. You, if you remember, we kind of reviewed our historic poems, the length of myotomy, which averaged nine centimeters down to today, where it's uh, a little bit less than five centimeters. So it's definitely has uh, reduced the length of our myotomy in clinical practice. Philip, any comment from you? Yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, a regular uh, user of uh, the endoflip as well, but uh, I think there's a uh, definite role in terms of guiding the efficacy of myotomy for relief of the dysphagia. While I'm really interested to look at the, whether it will also be correlating with the incidence of GERD, because uh, that might the relief of the uh, dysphagia and also the uh, placement length of the myotomy may or may not correlate with um, the uh, occurrence of the reflux. It's very interesting, Philip, because since we have been, uh, actually we, we contributed to the development, the end of flip, uh, and uh, uh, we described the first use for this particular purpose. So for 10 years, we've been using it. And uh, if we look back at our series, uh, we have less than 10% of patients complaining of GERD which is uh, actually pretty good all considered, but we have always used the end of flip and we've always done uh, a short uh, tailored myotomies. So uh, maybe it's, a, uh, it's something that, uh, especially at the beginning of the practice should be um, used. Any question from the participants? Juan. Yes, uh, there are two questions. They are kind of related, so I will put them together. So the first is uh, related with the other structures in the abdominal cavity when you are adding the fund application. And the second is what you think about the hybrid approach, including a laparoscopic fund application after the poem. Thanks. Uh, so, 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 sorry, sorry. So I, 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 I cannot put the first question once again. So first question. So the first question is, once you enter the peritoneal cavity with yeah. your scope, uh, yeah. what about the other organs? I think, can you understand the anatomy so that you don't make any injury uh, to uh, other yeah. structures? And, and more precisely, the, the, the risk of picking other structure in this uh, procedure. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. 
So uh, before getting abdominal cavity, so we confirm the uh, distal end of the submucosal tunnel already reached to the uh, uh, abdominal esophagus. Then, so we carefully uh, dissect the peritoneum. So uh, in front of our view, we can see a uh, left liver row backside. And then, so getting an uh, abdominal cavity. So uh, pneumoperitoneum already obtained, so um, kept. So um, bottom, bottom of the cavity, we can see a gastric wall or some other. So anterior wall, just the abdominal wall. So everybody knows, surgeon knows, uh, so when we perform a laparoscopic surgery, uh, in the uh, top loop, loop of the cavity, so just the abdominal wall. The bottom, so we have a loop, uh, yes. So uh, bottom, we, we have a lots of uh, important organs, but we are approaching just the uh, stomach, so it's okay. So, but, but we can see so many organs, <laughs> but, but I don't want to touch it. <laughs> don't touch it. But I think that uh, we, we have beautiful high definition now images. So it's, uh, it's a That's very fine. beautiful view, the same that you would get uh, with laparoscopy. So uh, almost the same that you would get uh, with, uh, with laparoscopy. So if you have an understanding of the anatomy, it's okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture in this very advanced technique if you didn't go and train with, uh, with uh, Professor Inoue though. Uh, he's, uh, don't, don't do that just, just now. <laughs> Lee, yeah, you yeah. have a comment. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay, please, Lee, please. Hey, Haru, it's great to see you. Um, I have a fairly basic question. Um, endoscopic suturing has been the other big change, the big advance in endoscopy through space explorations and then endoscopic suturing. You showed us a rather novel uh, device. Uh, so my question is, uh, maybe you can describe uh, if that's commercially available. And how do you introduce that sharp pointed needle uh, down to the place where you're using it? And what would you do if you drop the needle in the peritoneal cavity? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. So uh, when we uh, introduce uh, the needle, so we keep the uh, needle in the uh, uh, distal attachment. We keep the uh, uh, needle in the distal attachment. That, that is a transparent cap, what I mean. And then, so uh, we bring it, uh, the keeping it in the cap and then abdominal cavity, we uh, needle out uh, from the cap and then uh, place a suture. So um, it's a commercially available uh, from an endoscopy company, one of, and then um, uh, it's a uh, looks easy, <laughs> looks easy, I, I hope so, but actually not easy, not easy technically. So uh, we need uh, some uh, refinement of the device. So, uh, and then uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Ri, is uh, uh, you are the um, uh, user of the uh, overstitch uh, from Apollo. So uh, would you have uh, so some uh, application of the uh, overstitch in a submucosal tunnel? Um, that's a good question. Uh, certainly when we start talking about endoscopic suturing, overstitch comes to mind. I, I'd have to say that uh, the overstitch is really not adapted to close work or extreme retroflexion work. And, um, and for that reason, I think it's probably not the ideal uh, instrument for third space work. Uh, the cap, uh, the attachment itself is a little bit uh, uh, rough and uh, certainly is quite a bit larger uh, then we like to make the tunnel usually. So, so uh, maybe someday they'll miniaturize it. But for now, I think um, uh, we need some other suturing technology like you showed uh, other than the overstitch and in, inside a third, third space. Gert, for, uh, Gert, good. <laughs> Lee, for the sake of time, I think we have to go on with uh, actually your presentation. And uh, well, uh, everybody knows Lee Swansfern. He's a great friend uh, and a great inventor and innovator. And he has been pioneering this other use of a tunneling technique in order to perform a, a pylorus myotomy, the POP technique. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Silvana. Happy to uh, uh, kind of 
share our experience to date. Uh, you ask for a, a kind of tech, tech, technique heavy uh, orientation, so happy to uh, uh, do that. And, and we're going to talk about peroral pyloromyotomy, a little bit of a controversial thing. Uh, many of us call it POP, uh, as you can see, peroral pyloromyotomy. Others call it G-POEM, and I think that's in tribute uh, to Professor Inouye and his contribution to this because we use many of the same technologies as one would use in POEM. Uh, my disclosures, uh, by nature of my job here in Strasbourg, I see a lot of companies. So, so I think first, uh, maybe I'll just give a little bit of background, not a lot, but um, uh, gastroparesis is an interesting disease. It's not much talked about. There's a little bit of a stigma associated with it, but it's tremendously common and growing more common. The incidence of diagnosed gastroparesis, as you can see, is twice the incidence of uh, achalasia, so important disease. And it's calculated that it's probably underdiagnosed and is perhaps as many as 1.8% of the population uh, suffers from this problem. Of course, it's a spectrum of disease and, and many of those are, are treated easily with over-the-counter medications or diet changes. As you can see from that curve though, it's frightening growth in the frequency of this disease, um, particularly in North America, and most of this data is around North America. Um, it's expensive disease. Uh, the average uh, uh, cost of a hospitalization for a diagnosis of gastroparesis is up to 34,000 US dollars. Uh, and if you add that up for all the cases treated in the United States, uh, that's 568 million uh, dollars uh, so a very significant, important uh, disease. Uh, it's also a difficult problem uh, for clinicians to treat. Uh, many people run away from when they hear that uh, 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 gastroparesis patients coming into their clinic uh, and, and try to avoid them at any cost. And why is that? Well, like many chronic uh, digestive diseases, uh, these patients are sometimes difficult to deal with. Uh, they're sometimes depressed, angry, uh, often on narcotics, um, and it's a repeated disease. So they keep coming back and coming back either to the hospital or your clinic. So, uh, you know, it's uh, not easy for clinicians to do it. Uh, etiology is, is uh, varied, uh, but the big three, of course, are idiopathic, uh, diabetic, and post-surgical and those you'll hear most of. There's some a small number of other diseases. Fortunately, these don't really matter. The etiology doesn't really matter uh, as far as treatment goes because they all respond about the same uh, to treatment. Uh, so what are indications for intervention? I mentioned that the vast majority of these patients um, are treated uh, either medically or with uh, conservative treatments, uh, diet changes, low-fat diets, uh, uh, biofeedback, et cetera. And, um, uh, and only a few of them, small percentage of them go on to uh, uh, surgical treatments. These are the patients that are highly symptomatic and these symptoms can be very debilitating and you can see them listed here. Uh, there are alternatives, uh, pyloric dilatation or Botox, uh, even stents have been used. Uh, these have a very transient effect, uh, gastric neurostimulator, uh, is rather expensive uh, in the United States. It's fifteen thousand dollars, so uh, uh, we are fairly selective about who gets that. It really, we find it uh, primarily beneficial for nausea. Uh, surgical pyloroplasty has been a standard treatment. It's kind of a, have been our go-to treatment uh, to date. It's fairly easy to do laparoscopically. Uh, however, it's a real surgery, even if done laparoscopically a bit expensive and, and a little bit invasive. And then gastrectomy should be kept in mind. Uh, hopefully not very many patients need that uh, as it's very invasive and, and anatomy altering. Uh, but uh, uh, really you have to keep that in mind because a percentage of these patients will fail all treatments. And in the end, you have to take out their defective end organ, which is their stomach uh, to treat them. And they actually uh, this works fairly well for a complicated uh, group of these patients. So we're here to talk about the third space. And so endoscopic pyloromyotomy is kind of the new kid on the block, although it's not so new. 
Silvana and her group here at, uh, at ERCAD uh, have thought of this a long time ago. Uh, they published a nice study in pigs, uh, applying the poem technique to um, the pylorus, if you will, doing a myotomy down to the serosa, and demonstrated that that was good at relying, uh, relieving pyloric spasm. Um, it's evolved into a clinical procedure, and now it's entered into the out treatment algorithm for gastroparesis. And this is our current uh, treatment uh, paradigm, if you will. Once the diagnosis is made, of course, you put them through full medical evaluation that can include psychological evaluation. Uh, you do a gastric emptying study at some point if they fail this in particular. Uh, if they have massive food retention, a large bezoar or something like that, we tend to do a laparoscopic pyloroplasty for uh, really a mechanical opening of the distal stomach. Uh, we find that that does a little bit better. But all the others, we now go first to the POP procedure. And only if that fails, we consider either doing a laparoscopic pyloroplasty at that time or trying some of the other techniques such as gastric neurostimulator. Um, and as I mentioned, if everything fails, uh, in the end, uh, we offer the patient a gastrectomy. And these patients are desperate enough, enough that uh, they almost all accept that when you offer it. So the technique itself is going to look very similar to what uh, Professor Inouye described, uh, it's a tunneling technique, involves mucosal lift uh, techniques, if you're not familiar with that, uh, as, as he illustrated, in the distal stomach, tunneling down to the pyloric ring, uh, and then doing a myotomy down to the serosa, uh, up to the duodenum, which is a little bit different than the surgical approach, which uh, extends the myotomy onto the duodenal wall, and um, uh, and of course divides the serosa as well, um, either for myotomy, or pylor myotomy or pyloroplasty. Uh, so it's a, a little bit of a variation on the surgical technique. The equipment you need is essentially uh, what you would use for a poem procedure, high definition endoscope, injection needles, dissecting caps. Very important in all these procedures is a smart cautery device uh, because it's very small, uh, space, uh, you're operating close to the end of an expensive endoscope, and uh, I think you really need uh, uh, not just a standard surgical cautery, but uh, a smart cautery device. There's a variety of um, uh, electrocautery instruments these days, and of course you need a way of closing. Uh, our go-to closing is with endoscopic clips, but gastric mucosa has a tendency to uh, swell quite badly once you start manipulating it, and it's not that uh, unusual that we need to use an overstitch to close the mucosotomy, and so we always have that available. And uh, you can see uh, a, a picture of uh, Professor Inouye in the upper right there. This is when he was teaching me to do poem uh, many, many, many years ago. So uh, this is uh, the procedure itself. Uh, Jeff Marks was kind enough to give me this. The Cleveland Clinic uh, has developed a particular interest in this and probably has the largest uh, experience with it in the United States. And they do it just a little bit different. So I wanted to show kind of their technique. Notice a, a lift and then a horizontal uh, incision in the mucosa. And it's being done on the anterior lesser curvature side of the stomach. See the blue dye that's used to stain the lifting solution. and then tunneling as we saw in the poem procedure. It's a little bit different than poem because the scope doesn't automatically track to the pylorus, so you often have to withdraw the scope and reorient. Now you'll see coming into view the pyloric ring, the white muscular structure. It's now exposed and the muscles starting to be divided. Here you can see the mus muscle ring starting, starting to become apparent. Our friends at the Cleveland Clinic just divide the pyloric ring. They don't uh, extend, extend it any further. Uh, this, is, this is the duodenal mucosa or duodenal uh, area right there. You'll notice that it never advances the scope there. 
and more dividing the pyloric ring more and more and there you can see it popping up popping apart as a very distinctive circular muscle um, right there and that's pretty much where they quit their dissection once they see that uh, separation of the ring. And then of course you have to close it. You notice that it doesn't really make the pylorus a lot different, but it certainly decreases the compliance if you measure it with the endoflip. And here's a nice closure with clips. And the end of the procedure. To our uh, technique, um, uh, we do it in the posterior greater curvature, so the opposite, uh, exactly uh, uh, 180 degrees opposite. And you'll see that we make a vertical incision. Just used to doing that from home, using a, a balloon to kind of gain entrance into the submucosa. And then it's much, much the same before using a triangle tip knife, dissecting now and another difference is uh, we like to make an incision. We start the uh, myotomy on the gastric antrum uh, two or three centimeters and divide the gastric antrum for two or three centimeters going down you'll see this rosa in just a little bit. So this takes a little, little bit of a delicate dissection because uh, cirrhosis is rather adherent to gastric muscle, of course, and the mucosa is. Here you can see us cutting the antral muscles. And then moving up uh, to the pylorus. Now we're at the pyloric ring. And dissecting the pyloric ring that you saw before and then closing once again the myotomy with clips and sometimes with sutures. So uh, I was asked to also present, prevent some, present some um, evidence uh, or results uh, from it. This is from our own experience, kind of combining the one, the few that we've done in, in France with the, my Portland, Oregon uh, group and experience. I have to note that we don't see a lot of this in France. Uh, uh, my suspicion is that eating so important to the French is that if they get this diagnosis, they just commit suicide. But it's um, common in the United States. So uh, almost 100 patients, it takes uh, a couple hours to do it, um, uh, setting up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, less these days. Um, complications are fairly rare. A bleeding uh, happens occasionally. Um, you do have to put the patients on high dose PPIs. If they don't take them, then that um, uh, mucosal incision will ulcerate and uh, create problems. Uh, length of stay is a little bit longer, kind of surprisingly long, but these patients are very complicated. Uh, as I mentioned, they might be malnourished, they may be on narcotics, uh, and uh, they uh, simply need some extra care in the majority of cases. Results are rather astonishingly good. Uh, this is kind of a VISIC score at uh, two weeks and six months uh, from this early series of ours. Uh, you'll notice a fairly profound uh, decrease in their scores uh, and this tends to persist at least for the six months. Um, 78% enjoy good, good results. Um, uh, you know, a quarter of them just don't seem to have much change in it and they go on to the next step in the algorithm. Uh, as mentioned, the uh, uh, good results seem to persist, at least for the short term. Uh, nobody's published real long-term data yet, uh, but uh, that sh should soon be coming since this has been around for a few years now. 28% 20, off of all medications, uh, which for this group of patients is, is, is very extraordinary. How about gastric emptying studies? Uh, well, this is the results for that, uh, preoperative uh, emptying time. Uh, at four hours, uh, 23, of course, less than 10% is considered normal. Host falls just below the, the lower uh, end of that at 8%. Uh, and the percent of patients that are completely normalized uh, with gastric emptying studies is uh, remarkably high, 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, it's a complex psychological disease, has a psychological component, and the correlation between a normal gastric emptying study and their symptoms uh, is a little bit hit or miss. So some of the patients that didn't normalize their gastric emptying study have tremendous symptom relief, and contrarily, some of the patients with a normal gastric emptying study still have a lot of symptoms. Frustrating aspect. Uh, this is pretty much replicated by all the uh, literature that's out there. Most series are rather small, but people, several people have done uh, kind of meta-analysis um, on, on the results. This is one with 150 patients, seven studies, and really reflects kind of our, our results uh, that we've experienced personally, um, fairly doable, uh, a few complications, mainly bleeding, um, the majority have some improvement uh, in their symptoms uh, and a fairly high uh, incidence of normalization of their gastric emptying study. Uh, another study, as is a, a fairly uh, thorough meta-analysis that was published this year, uh, showing uh, substantial, almost two times uh, improvement uh, in symptoms and endoscopic emptying results in their final conclusion uh, was a G-POM or POP is effective and shows promising outcomes uh, uh, for both objective measurements and symptom measurements for gastroparesis. So just uh, I'll end uh, on, on kind of my lessons learned, if you will. Um, POP maybe isn't the best thing for patients with large bezoars, uh, large solid food residuals. My personal feeling is that they should have a pyloroplasty. Also, if they need a, uh, adjuvant procedures and you're there, the lap pyloroplasty is fairly easy to do. Uh, while we use the greater curvature posterior gastric wall, other, other positions are advocated and can be done as you saw from the Cleveland Clinic uh, video. Uh, it's a big mistake to try to extend into the duodenum. Duodenum mucosa is rather fragile and putting a scope with a cap in it uh, can result in uh, tear to the mucosa in a very difficult place to repair. Fairly short tunnel, you don't need to tunnel a long distance and you should be prepared to close with an overstitch because sometimes that can be closed to, to uh, difficult to close with clips. And post-operative PPIs for two months, as I mentioned, uh, for the risk of ulceration of the mucosal incision. And then we've had a couple patients where we accidentally went full thickness um, uh, and we were able to do an endoscopic uh, Heineke Michelitz pyloroplasty as we do laparoscopically using the overstitch. Uh, so this is not, not an easy procedure, but it certainly is possible. And if you do accidentally perforate, um, um, uh, you can bail out endoscopically and not resort to surgery. Uh, so that's it. Um, it's a pleasure to, to discuss this and happy to answer questions. Uh, Lee, um, uh, any uh, question, Juan, from the audience on this particular topic? Not yet. So I have a, actually a, a comment and a, and a question, Lee. A comment is that I learned from you that it is very wise to give uh, patients a shot of uh, uh, steroids before starting the procedure because uh, getting in and out, manipulating in the tunnel can get the mucosa really uh, thick. Uh, and uh, should you have any trouble closing, uh, I know that you advise to have an overstitch if available, uh, available, uh, so that you could do, uh, could close uh, the uh, an, an opening of the mucosa with the overstitch, correct? Yeah, that's, we found that to be quite important. And, and we do, as you mentioned, routinely give a, a fairly large dose of steroids at the beginning of the case for two reasons. One is that's a good treatment of nausea, and these patients, of course, are chronic uh, retchers and vomiters, uh, but also, as you say, ga uh, gastric mucosa especially is, is very prone to edema and can be very difficult to get clips on. And, and just as, uh, to let you know that we, not, not Julie, but the audience know, if they don't know it already, that overstitch also comes with resorbable sutures and those should be used in this case because no resorbable theoretically should be removed in order to prevent um, ulcerations. Um, Philip, uh, Aru, any comment on that? Are you performing this technique? I guess, yes. 
Yes, uh, but we have a very limited number of patients and we also actually did the laparoscopic antera implantation as well, but just a few case. So I'd like to ask Lee, uh, from your experience, so which kind of patient with gastroparesis that benefit most from this procedure? Because we know uh, it will be uh, some patient with a post-surgical injury to vagal nerve, uh, diabetes related, idiopathic. So how do you select your cases? Yeah, it, it turns out that it doesn't really matter what the etiology is. They're more or less the same results uh, with the treatment. Um, Post-surgical can have some anatomic issues, adhesions, kinking, things like that. And so uh, they're probably a little bit more variable and you have to be yeah. a little bit more selective on who you would offer, offer that to. Uh, but the diabetics and the idiopathic do about the same um, uh, maybe maybe the idiopathic a little bit better than the diabetic patients, but uh, it doesn't really change the treatment algorithm. And just so, one Lee, Sorry. may I ask may I ask your indication? Uh, it's okay. So, um, uh, in Japan, and so number of patients not so many, not so high. So, um, we decide indication like like this way. So, is it okay or not? So, uh, may I ask you? So, um, if we have the patient of the gastric paralysis, so uh, before performing this procedure, uh, we perform the button dilation of the uh, pyrodus ring. If it's effective, then uh, we perform the po uh, pop. So is it okay? Our, our strategy is okay, acceptable, or not good? So would you give us a comment? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a, a, a very good question. Um, and, and that is widely practiced that you do a, a kind of a trial before you commit them to, to an intervention. Um, often it's dilation and Botox. Uh, Botox, of course, has a, a you know a transitory effect of a few months, yes. and, and you see how the patients do, and and certainly if they do great, and then it comes back in eight months, uh, you can feel fairly reassured that uh, they would do well with a uh, G poem, but um, you know it, that's a second intervention. It's almost as invasive to inject somebody with uh, uh, Botox. Botox isn't cheap. Uh, and and uh, dilate them with a balloon, uh, et cetera. Maybe a little bit less risky, but uh, we don't do it real often, only in really difficult cases, just because of the cost <laughs> of double procedure aspect. But it, it's widely done that way, and it's it's not it's a important um, important trick for difficult to diagnose or patients where you just don't have a feeling mm -hmm. that they'll do well. Thank you very much. Uh, your nice comment. So, so we have one hands up, correct? Yes, Dr. Gold, he's uh, already on mute, so you can talk freely, thank you. Thank you, uh, Monsieur for presentation. Uh, two short questions. Uh, first uh, to Lee, do you have any experience with children? I mean, uh, the hypertrophic uh, pyelodostenosis. And the second one to Silvana, uh, do you have any experience with esoflip dilation of the pylodus? Thank you. So, so I'll answer first. There's been no reports of this being done on children for pyloric um, hypertrophy. Um, it's doable. On the other hand, I think most pediatric surgeons would argue that it takes 10 minutes to do a, 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 a traditional uh, pyloromyotomy in these kids, and, and why do it? Uh, and as Haru can say, Haru's done children as young as three and maybe even younger now it's a little bit more difficult to do the third space endoscopy in, in really small children, but doable. And Silvana, do you want to answer the endoflip? Yes, I, the esoflip. The esoflip is a dilation balloon that has exactly the same um, um, capability uh, of the endoflip. So it can measure resistance to distension, compliance, and distensibility. And actually, it's a very beautiful tool. I haven't used uh, it for the pylorus. I've seen it. I've seen videos, and I, I heard reports, but. Uh, I think that it's, uh, once again, uh, I, I think it's a tool that can be very, very useful, especially if you're willing to, to, uh, to understand what you're doing. And if you want to do a controlled uh, uh, dilatation, I think it's a, it's a fantastic tool. 
Uh, Lee, for the sake of time, if you agree, being my co-chair, I would, uh, as a courtesy to Philip, because I really want to hear his presentation and give him the opportunity to discuss with the audience, I would give him the floor and I will step back. And uh, if there is time, I will give mine after Gianfranco's. So Philip's, uh, Philip, if you don't mind uh, going ahead with your, with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Savannah. So uh, let me uh, first uh, share my PowerPoint. So can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, very nice opportunity to uh, speak about the submucosal tunneling and uh, endoscopic resection stir or uh, actually been pioneered by Professor Inoue that this is called the oral endoscopic tumor resection. So I think uh, there's an increasing potential of therapeutic endoscopy as we can see with the development uh, uh, from ESD and then NOGS and then now we have um, with the start of the poem, then we have the submucosal endoscopic uh, procedures. And the concept of the uh, submucosal tunnel endoscopic resection or the peroral endoscopic tumor resection is uh, through the tunnel to resect a submucosal tumor. I think most of the submucosal tumor that we encounter in the esophagus are likely to be arising from the synchymal layer and they are uh, lyomyoma, usually from muscularis propria, sometimes or muscularis mucosae. They are benign and rarely transform into malignancy or a gist tumor, which is also rare in the esophagus. And uh, the other uncommon uh, tumor includes schwannoma, fibroma, or vascular tumor. For the gastric submucosal tumor, we have uh, most commonly encountered gist tumor, and the indications for surgery according to the NCCN guideline will be larger than two centimeter in size. We need margin negative resection and uh, with the integrity of the tumor capsule but we don't need a lymphoid dissection. That makes a local resection uh, um, uh, totally feasible. And the secondly is a lyomyoma, which again usually occur at the gastric cardia. Swanoma, atopic pancreas will be uh, less common. And when we are considering uh, treatment of upper uh, GI subepithelial tumors, I think uh, for asymptomatic patient, they may be detected during screening endoscopy or accidentally during an endoscopy. Uh, so patient may not want to have a regular endoscopic surveillance or they are very worried about this tumor and uh, subjecting for uh, endoscopic resection. And secondly, of course, if the patient is uh, symptomatic like a dysphagia, pain, or even GI bleeding, they should be uh, managed. And the third is the risk of the malignant potential within this uh, submucosal tumors. So uh, with the example of uh, comparing uh, parole and, and endoscopic tumor resection against a uh, thoracoscopic and new creation of esophageal submucosal tumor, I think you may be able to see the advantage because uh, when we are doing endoscopic resection, we don't need to uh, collapse one lung, while for thoracoscopic and new creation, it's totally feasible uh, procedure, but we have to collapse the patient's one lung. While for the uh, endoscopic uh, resection for a uh, gastric uh, submucosal tumor, they're usually located uh, from my experience uh, in the gastric cardia, lesser curvature and antrum, where even laparoscopic wedge resection may cause uh, difficulty or even induce a stricture formation. And uh, so that would uh, cause uh, the uh, difficulty in managing those procedures through laparoscopy. So they are indicated then for a submucosal tumor resection. Uh, my technique of uh, doing this uh, poet or stir is uh, first I do a, a submucosal tunnel, usually two centimeter proximal to the tumor and then dissect around uh, this uh, tumor with the uh, development of a tunnel all the way to the distal end. And I would create around one to two centimeter of uh, distal pocket for manipulation. So I'd like to show a few video clips about the procedure. So this is a uh, esophageal submucosal tumor and uh, located at the mid part of the esophagus. So as I mentioned, firstly, I would develop a tunnel, uh, actually two centimeter proximal to the tumor. And then afterwards, uh, I would uh, be able to reach the tumor as you can see here. And then I create the uh, submucosal tunnel around the tumor. I try to avoid uh, directly going into the, uh, uh, the uh, bisection between the uh, muscularis propria and the tumor because that may end up in a almost full thickness uh, 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 bisection 
and then entering into the uh, extraluminal space, that may induce a little bit more of the gas-related complication. So I try to mobilize the tumor around. So the usual um, instrument that I use will include uh, the dual knife and also the IT nano within uh, the uh, some mucosal tunnel. So uh, during the dissection, I think the IT nano helps a lot in the uh, dissection process and uh, separating the tumor from the surrounding mucosa and the muscularis. And uh, afterwards, uh, I have to uh, complete the dissection uh, of the tumor from the muscularis uh, propria, and that uh, may uh, sometimes encounter a uh, major beating vessel. So uh, we need a coagulation the mode for the dissection. So uh, I think uh, the difficulty in the, this uh, submucosal dissection because of uh, the uh, limitation of the space within the tunnel, especially when you have a large tumor, uh, the distal end may be difficult to appreciate uh, a complete uh, resection. So uh, sometimes we need to manipulate and push the tumor around so that we can ensure a complete dissection. And then afterwards, uh, the removal is another challenge. So you can see this tumor may be a little bit big for the mucosal entrance. So uh, my trick is uh, either I extend uh, the mucosal entrance or sometimes I actually open up a distal exit site uh, so that I can uh, uh, retrieve the tumor. So after enlarging this uh, mucosal incision, then uh, I would uh, be able to retrieve the tumor, but uh, this end up in a little bit of a large size of the mucosal entrance. So I need to close with uh, multiple clips, and uh, in this case, it's uh, 20 clips. So uh, and then the, eventually I encountered that the patient have some fever and uh, after drinking fluid uh, on post-op day four. So I tried to explore again and found that there's a very small gap at the proximal site. So I actually close it with the uh, crib and the loop technique. So um, with the extension of the uh, mucosal entrance, sometimes uh, that may be too big for a multiple crib application, but uh, so a early intervention uh, will be uh, important. So this is another case, uh, the tumor is located at the gastric cardia. So I first open up uh, the uh, mucosal entrance over the esophageal side, and then uh, develop a tunnel all the way to reach the tumor at the gastric cardia, and then uh, dissect the tumor around uh, from the uh, mucosa and also uh, from uh, the underlying uh, muscularis propria. And uh, in this case, um, the tumor is uh, more located over the uh, fundal area of the greater curvature. So sometimes uh, it may be difficult for us to turn the, uh, the scope to uh, allow the uh, dissection of the tumor. So eventually I open up a uh, mucosal entrance at the uh, fundal side and uh, push the tumor in the stomach and then uh, remove it. So this is another case. So a uh, third uh, case is a uh, very large uh, gastric submucosal tumor around six centimeter over the lesser curvature. So again, the, because of uh, the alignment, which is very close to the gastric cardia, I first open up the mucosal entrance over the um, esophageal side, and then the, continue the dissection and development of the tunnel and until I reach this tumor. And uh, if you look into the um, arrangement and also the appearance, it is more like a lobulator. So when I'm dissecting, I already know that this is a, a lyomaoma. So, by then I uh, uh, continue the dissection because this is a lyomaoma, it's uh, usually intermingled uh, between the muscularis propria layer. So uh, sometimes uh, it may be uh, difficult to decide on the margin of the tumor because uh, it may intermingle with the muscle fiber. So at that time you have to just cut into the muscularis uh, propria layer and uh, continue this uh, dissection of the mobilizing the tumor. As I mentioned, we need a, a good space. So in the stomach, it's better to, for creation of the space uh, because um, then uh, the uh, stomach, uh, some mucosa, you can develop a, a large area. But the, in the esophagus, it's uh, more difficult. So I continue all this dissection. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, uh, you may be, um, get lost within the uh, submucosal tunnel because of the limitation in the space uh, so that uh, you need uh, to orientate yourself and sometimes uh, you need to pull back the scope and look at the tumor again. So uh, this is, I think the final part, uh, dissecting at the base with the muscularis. As I mentioned, sometimes you encounter some beating vessel. 
So you need to do good hemostasis, so uh, very close to the muscularis. So uh, this is uh, almost the final part of the dissection here. So uh, for this uh, case, uh, we can see uh, luckily very clearly uh, the base of the tumor uh, because we have a good uh, space for the dissection. So uh, this is the uh, final part of the cutting. And then the, I try to pull this tumor out, but again, limited by the mucosal entrance because uh, my mucosal entrance is over the esophagus. So I need to go through the uh, uh, lower esophageal sphincter, which is very difficult. So in, in the, on the contrary, I actually push the tumor inside the stomach, again, opening up the exit site over the gastric mucosa and retrieve the tumor. So like that, this is a, a very big uh, tumor. So after, um, so this is uh, another fourth case, uh, tumor located at the antrum. For this tumor, it is more like a uh, POP procedure or GPOM procedure. So uh, just uh, inject over the uh, antrum and then uh, open up a mucosal entrance, very much like the uh, POP procedure shown by uh, Lee just now and then the dissect around this tumor. And uh, so uh, from the look, this is more like a ectopic pancreas because uh, it doesn't have a, a good uh, encapsulated, uh, you know, surrounded uh, by a capsule. So, and uh, then uh, after the uh, dissection, very near to the tumor, I have completed uh, this uh, uh, dissection and then removed the tumor and uh, the final part is uh, closing the defect, so with the clips. And I shared the, also with the experience uh, from Lee that uh, sometimes the uh, gastric mucosa uh, at the distal part is uh, very thick. So it may be difficult for us uh, to use a clip or closure. So sometimes I actually open a little slit over the mucosa so that uh, I allow the uh, clip to be able to uh, attach and uh, complete the uh, closure. And of course, clip and the loop technique or even the suturing technique uh, will be good for this uh, closure. So uh, just a little bit sharing of uh, my uh, experience. So we have recently published uh, this data of uh, POET for upper GI submucosal tumor, uh, 51 case and uh, mostly located at gastric cardia, uh, lesser curvature and the antrum. Size of tumor is uh, 20 mm and the operative time is 90 minutes. So some uh, technical difficulty that require conversion. One is uh, difficulty to remove the tumor from the distal esophagus. So converting it to laparoscopy. It's a free converter to endoscopic full fitness resection. And the two require a uh, double mucosal entrance and exit. So from our uh, review on the ESD treatment for upper GI uh, submucosal tumor, Actually, in the past, uh, from mostly from the Chinese uh, uh, reported data, showing that uh, there is a higher risk of uh, perforation because of uh, the uh, ESD procedure. And this tumor, by nature, is in the submucosa, so attaching to the muscularis, so high chance of uh, uh, developing a perforation. So with the development of the POET or the STIR, uh, this is another uh, meta-analysis summarizing the data actually showing that the on-prop resection rate is uh, 94% and the complete resection rate is uh, 97% uh, of uh, all uh, prospective core or retrospective core study. And uh, this is a very interesting comparison, a retrospective comparison uh, from two uh, cohorts uh, comparing uh, STIR or POET against the uh, thoracoscopic enucleation of esophageal uh, Lao Mauma showing the uh, similar on-prop resection rate uh, a slightly shorter operative time for STIR as compared to uh, thoracoscopic and nucleation, while um, the development of uh, pneumothorax and the pleural effusion can occur during the STIR, uh, while uh, interestingly, there's also serious complication from thoracoscopic and nucleation, including esophageal pleural fistula. So uh, I guess uh, the uh, more obvious advantage is that uh, we don't need to open the, the uh, thoracoscopic thoracic cavity and uh, avoid a one lung ventilation. So finally, I think uh, POET or STIR has its own limitation. First is that the maximal size of uh, these uh, submucosal tumor that uh, we can resect it. For example, from our experience is uh, six centimeter. And also um, from the other series like uh, the Chinese series of uh, focusing on the management of a large submucosal tumor also report around similar size of a tumor resected. 
Second is the complication rate of pool analysis will be around 18%, mostly gas related like a surgical emphysema, pneumomedicinum or pneumothorax or pneumoperitoneum. It required general anesthesia. And third is that uh, the risk of incomplete resection, especially if we are dissecting too close to the tumor capsule for a case of a gist tumor. So in summary, I think a stir or POET can achieve high rates of resection for upper GI submucosal tumor. And it has the advantage of a laparoscopic uh, or fluoroscopic resection, especially uh, for tumor located in the esophagus, cardia, lesser curvature, and antrum. The limitation of the stir and POET include the size of the tumor resected and also the risk of incomplete resection if we are dissecting too close to the tumor capsule for a gist tumor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. This was a uh, great, great presentation, great review, and of course, great videos. Uh, um, I see that uh, Gianfranco has joined uh, the panel, and uh, you're aware you're in your working clothes, so I guess you're running in and out of the OR. Gianfranco, welcome. So um, I, I, I know that there is a question for Philip. So before Juan starts uh, looking at uh, the, uh, the audience feedback, I, um, I, I, I see that Bernard has joined too, because I was thinking about him, because I remember that uh, we were sitting at a very important meeting, I will not mention where, uh, and we had a uh, world expert, of course, none that is participating to this panel, who was performing a stair uh, uh, procedure for a GIST uh, uh, tumor in the esophagus. And uh, I, I saw Bernard looking horrified at the huge, gigantic screen because there was a, a clear uh, a violation of the capsule. So Bernard, I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. <laughs> but, uh, yes, thank you, Silvana. I think you, you, you're nice when you're talking about a violation of the capsula. There was there was a morselation of a gist, yes, large yes. gist, inside of the extrapolar space. I mean, uh, we had pieces of uh, gist everywhere in the uh, the right uh, lung uh, pleura uh, because uh, the the surgeon opened also the pleura. So. Uh, we know that in surgery, and uh, Aru and Philippe knows it very well, so it, is that um, the first rule for treatment of GIST is to remove without uh, infraction of the uh, capsula. And so this is my question for, for Philippe, uh, because when I look at the data, I mean, no one is ever mentioning uh, the rupture of the GIST when trying to manipulate, when trying to... Uh, to, uh, to, to grab the, the, the gist. So Philippe, I don't know what's your opinion about that. Yeah, I think this is a really important. And as a surgeon, I think we share the same uh, you know, passion as I described in this uh, presentation. Most important is the indication. So we have to be selective. We, if we have the, you know, the tool, it doesn't mean that you know, we have the hammer, everything becomes a nail we need to have a good selection. So for GIST tumor, I think uh, we, we, we shouldn't actually select all cases for a uh, submucosal tunnel resection, simply because working within the tunnel is a limited space. So uh, I have actually compared our experience of uh, endoscopic full fingers resection compared to a submucosal tunnel resection for GIST in the stomach. And we found that we have a much higher on broad resection rate for EFTR, endoscopic full fingers resection. So that should be the principle for GIST. For lyomyoma in the esophagus, which is most common, I, I think we agree that we can actually do a tunnel resection that would avoid uh, the one lung ventilation. But uh, in the esophagus, rarely we encounter the GIST, but it's important that if there are features of the GIST, including from the EUS and also the CT, uh, uh, then we should actually do a fluoroscopic annuation or even sometimes esophagectomy. Thank you. We have, uh, uh, we have one question from the audience. Yes, Dr. Seal is asking about the, the mucosa, if it's after the resection, is you're always closing the mucosa or not? 
Yes, I always uh, close the mucosa because uh, I think uh, firstly, it's uh, feasible all, almost all the time to close the mucosa. And secondly, uh, because the back side of uh, the uh, resection field will be uh, muscularis phobia, and sometimes we have a full layer of uh, defect over the muscularis. So it, even if our mucosa is not overlapping with uh, the uh, muscularis uh, back layer, but uh, there may be some uh, fluid leaking through the tunnel. So I think the best uh, is to close uh, all the mucosal entrance. Thank you. Any other question? No, no, no. I have a quick one for you, uh, Philip, and I, and I have, uh, I mean, all the panel is invited to answer this. You mentioned something very important. Sometimes when you get very close to the muscle, you can have big perforating vessels that are feeding the tumor or are in the, in, the, in the muscle layer. Uh, what do you do if you get into major bleeding? We know that you cannot just put a clip there. So what, what, is, your, what is your approach to control bleeding? So I think from my experience, uh, Almost all case, we have some uh, major vessel, but those major vessels are not so big, not to be able to uh, uh, control by endoscopic method like uh, coag grasper uh, or even using our own uh, ESD device. But I have one case where I'm dissecting over the submucosal tumor at the entrum and it's over the lesser, uh, greater curvature side. And there's a major feeding vessel from probably a branch of the gastroepipoic vessel right side. I have to stop because it's too big for endoscopic uh, management and I have to convert to laparoscopic uh, uh, resection and I need to control it by uh, the uh, Ligasure. Yeah, I think that's a very important message. Be wise and don't think that you can do everything only with one technique. Be prepared to work with your, with your colleagues or if you're a surgeon to mix and match laparoscopy and, and endoscopy. Uh, Lee, if you agree, we would move to uh, Gianfranco. Uh, who's uh, going to show us his technique to uh, manage a uh, uh, large tumors with a uh, submucosal tunneling technique. Uh, I asked Gianfranco to select a few videos. I'm sure he has uh, a whole uh, spectacular selection oh. for us ready. Cool. Before you start, Gianfranco, I'll just make one comment, a very uh, unique comment. I don't know if the audience noted, but all these panels are surgical endoscopists. Uh, all of them are surgeons and endoscopists and GM Franco is the same thing. Okay, thank you Lee, thank you Silvana and uh, uh, thanks everybody to give me the possibility to, to share my experience with uh, between the, 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 the fathers of the tunnel of the technique. So I will share my, one moment, my presentation. Scarf, or are you wearing your 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 you uh, or a hat? Did you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So uh, endoscopic submucosal tunneling for large tumors. So uh, nothing to disclose. Do you know better than me that uh, ESD is something that can be uh, very difficult and uh, maybe for the for uh, surgeons that not are very. Uh, useful to, for, to, um, to use endoscopy for the first time because you know now surgeon is approaching to do endoscopy and uh, thanks to all uh, our works they are very close now to, to gastroenterologists and they are uh, uh, increasing their skills to perform surgical intervention by scope. You have to know that uh, ESD uh, also for us, that endoscopy at the beginning was difficult. There is, uh, is sometimes uh, it's complicated to take the good plane. Sometimes it's complicated to remove the lesion completely. And the text, to you know, to the technique of the poem with uh, with uh, this uh, third space that is there, we uh, we starting to do new stuff and modifying a little the technique. And the the, the Japanese described the evolution of the SD technique. We with the pocket uh, technique means that we do a creation 
of a submucosal pocket tank, thanks to the tunnel, uh, and we arrived by the other, by the uh, behind the, the lesion, by the other side, and then we totalized. And in my in my um, opinion, this is a very very um, a, a good technique. Do you know why? Because uh, Bernard Almagne, uh, all the time that we spoke about ESD technique, told me well, yes, but we need something to 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 reproduce some traction to lift the lesion and then we can, we can cut more easy. And I know that it works with, uh, with uh, for, um, some uh, robot technique to perform e ESD that works very well. It was published last year. And also once uh, he, prom he promised me to give me a grasper to, to, to lift the lesion for the um, submucosal ESD, rectal submucosal ESD, but uh, unfortunately never gave me. So we, I, I'm obliged to use the poker technique to have some, uh, some traction. And I will show you this, uh, this, uh, this small video. I have a huge experience about uh, ablation of um, submucosal tumor before obesity, before surgical obesity. I'm a center of reference for surgical, for endoscopic management of obesity and complication of obesity. So a lot of guy works in Paris, send me patients to remove a submucosal um, lesion before surgery. Do you know why? Why? Because sometimes the surgeons say are not all uh, hyper expert, or maybe are not all uh, not all does it want to, to do some um, intervention. As uh, uh, Dr. Chu, Professor Chu, uh, say before, sometimes to remove a, a submucosal lesion of the stomach, we can reproduce some stenosis. Do you, can you imagine if then we do? also sleeve, we can have a torsion, we can have a twist, we can have some other problem if we perform sleeve. But we, if we perform a um, bypass, we are obliged to remove the lesion. Not all surgeon remove surgically. So this is a patient that was addressed to me for a small lesion, submucosa lesion before um, before bypass. So I starting to do, um, we did the US, the US showed this lesion. It was very difficult for me to understand where the lesion was um, developed from submucosa. So I say, okay, uh, is a submucosa is a submucosa lesion standard one? I will remove. I starting to do uh, classic technique as uh, in a way, Professor Chu described. Um, I starting to do um, lifting, mucosotomy, then the tunnel. But unfortunately, despite I was in the good duration, I didn't find the submucosa spa the space, the, um, the, the lesion. So I understood then that the lesion was developing by mucosa lawyer. By, by sorry, um, with mucosa lawyer. So it was in the mucosal. And at this moment, when I arrived beyond the lesion, I used the poker technique to remove completely, like is the old lesion. So you can see here the contraction with my cap higher in the tunnel. And spontaneously, I do traction and I cut the edge of the lesion very easy and very fast. You can see here the lesion is there. Is in the in the is is developing by mucosa lawyer. It was not in the submucosa. This is not the lesion. The lesion is there. I will show you then. So with my cap, I pushing the cap, the lesion is completely lift, and without any traction, I can perform my dissection of my ablation of the lesion that is, is there. You can see here. And we totalize the circumferential incision. And the lesion is done. You can see here now. This is the dissection without any problem. Very, very fast, very, very fast. And you can see here the lesion that was there. And it was by mucosa alloy. And another, we, we increase the Japanese guy, increase more the technique, modify the technique. And I'm from uh, 
uh, I'm not oriental guy, so I have a small experience with the SD and with uh, with um, with uh, with the stare. Not, it's not small. It's small compared with the the, the Japanese guy. So we about tunneling is ESD. We perform mucosal incision at at proximal part and distal part of the lesion, and then we do the tunnel and also. With the cap, we can do blind dissection, just as, as you know, it described, and we can uh, remove all the lesion. This is a very good technique when we have a circumferential lesion. And uh, the technique is that you do proximal incision, then tunnelization, distal incision, maybe you, you can do both immediately, and then you totalize all, all the, 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 the section. I will show you this particular, this, this case. This is a proximal esophagus with epidermoid cancer. And if you can see, maybe there is a coloration, no? you can see, well, I did distal mark, proximal mark, but the lesion was not circumferential. So I did some mark here because in my mind, I say, maybe I can save this part. You can see the lesion is there, the lesion is there. I can I say, I can save a small part of esophagus, of mucosal esophagus to avoid the stenosis. So, but I was alone, I was starting to do, and they say, no, I cannot do that because maybe it's, more, it's, it's really difficult for me because at, at one moment I will lose the good plane. So I decided to do tunnel technique. I did the lift in the distal part, lift in the proximal part. I use all the time a dual knife G is a small catheter that you can cut in the same time you can inject. I did the dissection, I did the incision, proximal incision. Then this is the distal incision. I started to do distal incision. It's complete. Oh, the video is a short, but and then I started to do tunnelization, very easy because my aim was to arrive by the other side again in the esophagus. And then sometimes you, I, I check, I, I pass through the lesion just to check where where I am. So as in the in the poem and, and look that i'm now in the esophagus by the other side by the distal part of the lesion this is the normal esophagus and this technique gives me the, the possibility to collapse the lesion you can see here the lesion is completely collapsed there maybe i will show i don't remember but the lesion is completely collapsed there here and then I totalize the tunnel by circumferentially. And I have a, a, a physiological traction because I push with my cup and I have a physiological traction. And that's it. It's very easy to do. And this is a circumferential dissection. For sure, we have in this case stenosis, we inject corticoid and, and 15, 10, 15, Two weeks later, I control the patients and I inject some steroid to avoid the stenosis. But this patient did the stenosis and I delayed, I delayed the patient three times. So why tunneling is D or some uh, hybrid technique? Because you can have some traction, contralateral traction that had you. You can uh, inject and the injection, the lift stay there and give you the possibility to more fast. Is, uh, uh, easy to remove all the lesion also with the ulcer of also if there is a ulcer or fibrosis and with the cap you can do blunt dissection very 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 gently and uh, very gently and you can uh, you can go more fast what say literature literature say that if we compare tunnel with the standard technique in the esophagus and the stomach in the, in the stomach what we have in block resection is maybe a little better in a submucosal dissection. Hair zero, if we can remove all the lesion also, and is a little better, but it's very important that also the complication are less with this technique. And what about the time? Are really, really more fast to do tunnel than the other than the standard technique, if you can do. In conclusion, 
uh, endoscopic submucosal tunnel dissection is safe and effective for the treatment of large superficial esophageal neoplastic lesion. We have some case, I did some case in the stomach and in the rectum, I never did in the, in the colon. And uh, it's more easy and fast to do this, uh, the dissection with this technique, but you have to get, be careful that if you do circumferential, for sure, or maybe uh, is a uh, high probability that you, have, uh, you will have a stenosis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gianfranco. Uh, beautiful, beautiful presentation. I think that this was your your uh, baptême de feu. Uh, you're, you're, you're speaking in front of, uh, of Aru, so I, I am not sure if Aru approves your technique and Philip approves your technique, but uh, now, now you're good to go, I think. Uh, any comment, uh, Aru, Philip, or Lee on uh, Gianfranco's lecture? Ah, okay, so Gianfranco, so congratulations, a beautiful EST. And the, uh, yes, so uh, uh, submucosal tumor resection, you did it. <laughs> and the, uh, Thanks to uh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, submucosal pocket creation method is uh, uh, recommended by Dr. Yamamoto. Of course, you know. So yeah. he is uh, as a great guy. So uh, he did, uh, he actually do uh, very well. And the, uh, so uh, anyway, so you mentioned in, uh, in your talk, uh, physiological, physiological attraction, you said. So I, I totally, uh, we totally agree with you. So now the marked advancement, uh, technical advancement of the ESD is that anyway, we uh, give the traction to the uh, tissue, that's a point. So we can accept uh, any type of traction. So pocket creation method is a uh, one technique and the uh, other traction, uh, method, any type of traction we accept. So uh, track anyway, traction uh, technique but makes uh, ESD procedure faster and safer. Right, yes. You are right, it's the key, the traction. If you have the traction, it's the key to finish the, 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 the procedure. Jean so Franco, thank you very much, great talk, yeah. It's, it's, it's Christmas time, so I'll make sure that we deliver this famous grasper to you for next year <laughs> yes. as, as a present with a nice red ribbon on top of it. <laughs> Philip, any comment? Yeah, I think a really nice uh, technique. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, we all actually learned from Haru on the uh, tunneling uh, in the start of the poem. And then we actually come back to the ESD and uh, nicely demonstrated uh, with uh, the technique of the tunneling and allow us to have uh, a uh, circumferential resection make easy with the tunneling. Yeah. So uh, I'm really interested, you know, uh, in managing cases after the um, tun uh, circumferential uh, you know, mucosal resection because uh, that would almost 100% time end up in a uh, stricture. So what would be your protocol of, uh, you know, like do you give oral uh, steroid or do you do a repeated endoscopic dilatation for those cases? I repeat, I check the patient. My protocol is uh, to to check, to control the patients the 15 days. It is stenosis, dilation with injection of of corticoid of steroid, and uh, I do dilation every 15 days. It's not uh, if the patient is is uh, is, uh, is present stenosis anywhere to 15 days for three times. I dilate the patients. Wonderful. To That's to, uh, also to, what to, to prevent. Well, mostly to prevent. Yes. Yes. Uh, same as uh, I will also I do. I have to tell you something. I have to tell you just something. I'm a, a self-made man. I uh, learned ESD by 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 Japanese guy, a tunnel by you, by I saw the video of uh, in, in the Hirkad. I saw Silvana do poem, so I say I can do, and uh, I I try <laughs> I try to I I, I learn by you all. And uh, for me, that I'm not. I've, I'm not, uh, I'm not I, I don't have a lot of patients with this kind of pathology, but for me, the more simple is to do tunnel. All the time I can, I do tunnel because really, believe me, it's really safe, fast, and I'm, I, I, I'm comfortable with the tunnel. I, I, I arrive by the other side and then I totalize the dissection. It's really, uh, I, it's, 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 it's easy. It's, it's easy, and then for me, the time sergeant is more physiological to do that because I have my, my plane, I don't lose the plane, so I arrive by the other side and then totalize. This is my suggestion for all the guys that would like to do. 
Thank you, Gianfranco. So go tunnel, and I will uh, really keep my presentation to two, three minutes because we are running out of time. I uh, I think that Lee is gone. We lost Lee. I think that he just thought we were too late uh, as European, and, and then he just and in, in, in Asia and he left. Uh, but um, I am just going to very, very quickly talk about Z poem again, another tunneling technique, which is the technique of choice uh, in our center uh, to address uh, Zenker uh, diverticula and. Uh, it's a very nice technique because really it's a control uh, section of the septum because you can uh, skeletonize the septum uh, on the top and on the bottom and you can have a very nice clear uh, view on your on your uh, on your division on your myotomy which also helps to prevent recurrence and helps also to prevent um, complications um, we do a little bit different technique that was also uh, developed at from uh, uh, in in the US by by one of uh, Lee's fellows, unfortunately, he left, but Mike Ujiki does exactly what we do. So we don't start uh, um, uh, um, proximal to the diverticulum, but we really start at the level of the septum. Uh, we make a lift, we skeletonize the septum, and then we divide it once we have a, a, a complete view on the septum. Here is uh, how uh, it, uh, it uh, looks like. So first of all, we, um, uh, we uh, I identify the uh, the diverticulum. I don't know why this is not uh, running. Let me see if it runs like this. Okay, I'll try again. It works on my computer, but it's not working. Yes, it goes, fantastic. There we go. So um, we put a cap on which is the same thing you would do for any tunneling technique. And then we have a clear view on the septum. We're going to inject the septum and try to make a um, mucosal incision really parallel to the septum. At the beginning, we thought, OK, we want to really get rid of the uh, um, mucosa uh, redundance of mucosa. So we performed a a, um, a perpendicular cut, but this is definitely not a good idea. It's better to perform a, a longitudinal a longitudinal cut uh, because it's easier also to, um, to close. You will worry about the mucosa later. Of course, this is a technique that is best used for smaller diverticular. If you have a very, very large diverticular, maybe you should consider a, a rigid approach. Uh, once you are, uh, you made your, your space into uh, the, uh, the tunnel, where you can use a, a little biliary dilation balloon in order to inject a lifting solution. We like this balloon because it really forces the fluid into the tissue and, uh, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very ergonomic if you don't want to waste time. And it also uh, prevents you from making a very large opening because you can piggyback your scope into the, um, uh, the submucosal space onto the the little, uh, little balloon. So we are just skeletonizing the septum. And now when we have a clear view, we will start cutting. I like to use the TD knife uh, as I learned from, uh, from Aro, but uh, of course you can uh, use any kind of uh, knife, uh, also an IT knife. Um, the nice thing and the main difference here from the other uh, endoscopic approach with no tunneling and no submucosal dissection is that you can see what you do. You can really see where the septum ends uh, and where the uh, the wall of the esophagus starts. So it's a, it's a technique that gives very good results, uh, over 95% of clinical good results and less complication than a standard endoscopic technique. Then once you're done, you can close up the mucosal opening using a multiple clips. So we talked about the results. It's a multicentric study, very interesting, uh, over 75 patients. Most of the literature uh, contains really small series, but this is one of the largest. You can see the technical success rate is above 97%. That doesn't always correspond to the clinical su success, which is a little bit um, lower. 6% of complication. Just to end on the D poem, we have another letter. We have the old alphabet in front of poem. Uh, Dr. Inoue really uh, uh, started a trend with the, uh, uh, with the poem and the sub, uh, uh, mucosal tunneling technique. It can also be used on, uh, uh, to treat uh, failure of surgery after epiphrenic diverticulum to the point that there is a whole new uh, uh, way of approaching those diverticula if they're not too big uh, 
only with uh, a myotomy performed and then in a second time uh, performing a resection or an endoscopic PEXI if uh, it's uh, needed. This is a case of a patient who had a failed a previous laparoscopic uh, uh, um, uh, diverticulectomy and, uh, uh, and myotomy, and uh, that uh, we treated with a, um, with a uh, tunneling approach. And uh, you can see that the diverticulum here, it's pretty big. She was suffering from regurgitation and dysphagia. Uh, and uh, what we did, we used the endoflip at the neck of the diverticulum, and then again at the lower uh, esophageal sphincter, because in this particular case, which is not always the case with the Zenker diverticulum, Reticulum, you always have to treat the underlying disease. If the patient still has a dysmotility disorder of the esophagus, it should be taken care of, it should be treated, and the myotomy should encompass the whole length of the uh, motility disorders. If you keep the LES in place as it is, the, the, the diverticulum uh, will recur. So very, very similar technique. We have a mucosal lift and incision. We use our uh, little uh, uh, biliary uh, retraction balloon in order to get into um, the tunnel we're going to dissect. And this is interesting because this is really virgin territory. Of course, the myotomy that has been uh, performed surgically, that had been performed surgically, was on the anterior wall. So we're uh, operating here endoscopically on the anterolateral wall. And you can see that uh, you have the septum that is very, very easy to visualize. And we are cutting it. And we are prolonging the myotomy all the way down to the, uh, the LES. We have a direct view. Uh, we are not um, doing any collateral damage and we are fixing what surgery failed to uh, address. So with this, I would like to end my presentation for the sake of time. I just want to show you something that uh, hopefully will keep all the endoscopists of the world safe. Today, we perform our first uh, controlled endoscopic procedure thanks to a European project in collaboration with the Matter uh, Hospital uh, and Ronan Cahill in uh, Dublin. And the Pagliari company. Uh, we are uh, developing devices in order to prevent the aerosolization of uh, uh, viral particle, COVID-19 particles, but also surgical smoke in the OR. So uh, with this, I'd like to wish you a very, very safe and, uh, and happy 2021 and thank the faculty. And maybe uh, Juan, if there is any uh, question, no? No, no, there are no questions. No question. So uh, Ali is back. Here you are. You're back. I'm back. Sorry, I lost you for a minute, but uh, great talk, uh, Silvana. Thank you so much. And I agree. Thank you, all the panelists. A great uh, uh, series of talks around a theme uh, and uh, shows that surgeons can be good endoscopists as well. So uh, a good lesson all around. So thanks again, uh, Merry Christmas, enjoy the holidays and uh, be safe. And I hope to see you here in Strasbourg very soon. Bye. Bye, -bye. Nice Thank to see you. everybody. Thank thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yes, uh, Franco and the Philip. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry, Christmas Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas to the audience. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.